Welcome back, everyone. So we are continuing this uh, tour across the world and across the talent and, and people. And I have the privilege of uh, introducing you to or introducing to you Kevin Govender, who is our next speaker and is going to talk about astronomy for development. Uh, Kevin is um, background. I, I have to admit, I don't know that much. I know he, he has been trained as a, a nuclear physicist, if I'm not mistaken. I remember a very conversation we had many years ago in, in Greece when we were walking the streets in Athens together and he was telling me that he had a training on nuclear physics. Uh, but uh, the world um, took him to, to the realms of astronomy for development. And I'm very glad that uh, that happened. So I think basically the plans of Kevin is to take over the whole world. He's almost there. Uh, he's the director of the Office of Astronomy for Development, a very important initiative of the International Astronomical Union. And uh, he has established uh, a network of collaborators across the globe. And it's uh, uh, a growing network of uh, amazing human beings doing very important and outstanding things. And uh, Kevin is a very skillful person uh, with the right set of uh, skills and competences to convince uh, politicians and other uh, influencers to support this cause. So I'm very glad to be part of this uh, world and to have the opportunity to share this growth and this wealth of information and knowledge. Kevin, welcome to, to, to this uh, virtual globe. Uh, we're very glad to have you here and uh, I give you the floor to amaze everyone as you always do. No, no pressure, Rosa. Uh, um, thank you very much, Rosa, and thank you everyone who's listening and to the organizers of this meeting. I think uh, it's really incredible that you've managed to pull together such an amazing group of people from all around the world, and uh, I'm very honored to be part of part of this meeting. Um, so, so thank you very much, and thank you also for the. For the incredible efforts that uh, that you, Rosa, and the team uh, um, has been doing at Nucleo in so many areas. So um, let me uh, uh, start off by sort of adding a little to what Rosa said. You know, in terms of in terms of where I come from. Uh, um, so I'm 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 born and bred in South Africa. I I grew up on a little sugarcane farm on the east coast of South Africa. And, uh, um, and when, uh, uh, when Rosa asked me to, uh, to speak uh, about uh, the importance of inclusion as it relates to astronomy, astronomy development stuff, I thought, uh, um, how can I uh, uh, sort of have a thread uh, that tries to capture my understandings over the years about what inclusion means. And, uh, and so uh, I'm going to share my full screen. Uh, uh, can you see the screen? OK, Rosa? And yes, my... Kevin, we can. OK. Um, so also see what you guys are seeing in terms of uh, video. Uh, um, so I'm going to talk about inclusion, but I'm going to have a, a, a focus on um, on sort of the global picture and how um, we've evolved and how we've sort of how I've uh, grown to understand the term inclusion. Um, but uh, um, in doing so, I'll, I'll take you. I'll take you on a on a sort of story that uh, that I realized centers around three major topics: hope, humility, and tolerance. And I think these are threads that that connect um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. So I work for the for the Office of Astronomy for Development, 
Uh, it's a project sponsored by the Department of Science and Technology uh, in South Africa. Uh, it's now called the Department of Science and Innovation, the National Research Foundation, and the International Astronomical Union. So this is a partnership of a project uh, uh, where we're based here uh, in South Africa. Um, um, but our work is, um, is global. Now, as I run through here, I want to ask you, you know, this is an hour slot is a long time. I'll try not to speak for too long. Um, but as I uh, speak, these three themes, just keep these in mind. And I'll try and come back to it every now and then. When we look at this planet, there are many challenges that we are faced with, but there are also many, many things that, that bring us hope for the future. There are also things that, that, that make us worried about the future, makes me worried about the future and where our children uh, um, will be and what their world will be like. So if you stretch this out, like NASA has done, you see the world and like we see it in most maps. Um, you know, from space, you know, we always talk about this is a place without country borders, but the reality is that we do have country borders and we do have uh, 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 differences amongst, amongst uh, different regions of the world. And this, uh, you know, it's a famous thing. Many people would have seen me use this slide before uh, in my talks, uh, um, but I think it's 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 very effective and very glaring in terms of the Human Development Index of the United Nations uh, um, and how stark the continent of Africa stands out. Because as much as we would like the world to be equal, as much as we would like the world to to have, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, some form of, 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 uh, of acceptance, of tolerance, of, of understanding, we don't. The reality is that we, we, we have a world where we are divided by our country borders. We, we have these differences and, uh, and the question is, how can, we, how can we address this? Now, the previous speaker, Amelia, you know, uh, uh, who I know for many years, uh, uh, she's 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 far more experienced than me in, you know, on on topics of inclusion, and she's done an excellent job to sort of give 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 the bigger sort of definitions and so on of inclusion. So I'm not going to uh, try and challenge that, um, but I would like to to sort of bring your attention to some of the some of the things that we see from from this space. So, boom, 2018, we get this image. Uh, this is the image from, uh, from Mirka, the Karu Array Telescope in South Africa. Uh, it's a precursor to the Square Kilometer Array. And this image released in 2018 um, was the clearest radio astronomy images of the center of our, of our galaxy. Now, this was coming from that continent of Africa. Yes, it was coming from South Africa, which is, uh, uh, which is special in many ways. Um, but this was coming from Africa, the clearest picture of the Milky Way. And a quote that I, that I heard of, I wasn't at this meeting, but uh, the history of SKA conference, uh, um, uh, Peter Dudney said, it was as if radio astronomy in South Africa had been stored in a high pressure bottle and someone took the cap off. Now I'm painting this picture because, you know, most of you, all of you are involved in astronomy in one way or other. And I want to bring this back to inclusion at the end. Now, when we have this, this, this picture of the world and, and we see like, you know, how, 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 do, how do we naturally react to this? You know, uh, uh, the countries that are red, orange, and so on, the lower human development index, um, you know, 
it's natural to think, ah, you know, we need to help those countries. We need to, we need to uh, uh, um, maybe save people in these countries. And yet this image coming from this country, the, the growth of astronomy, the field that is one of the most challenging on this planet came driven from this continent. Now this is the reality. It came from a country of South Africa. And South Africa is one of the most unequal countries in the world. And that's why I said South Africa is a special place because this image you see on the one side, the townships, and on the other side, uh, the suburbs with swimming pools and so on. And this is the reality that we face in South Africa that we've grown up with in South Africa. Um, and this level of inequality in our country, this is what we see is a microcosm of the world because in this map, that is the world. We have the wealthy living next door, you know, planetary scale, next door to people who are in very different economic and um, uh, developmental circumstances. And when we, you know, uh, as astronomers talk about, you know, the big picture, the, uh, the famous pale blue dot, this was, uh, the Cassini image, the day the earth smiled, um, you know, it's, what, what sense does this make? How can we on this planet live with such inequality? Well, when I start talking, when, when I tie this talk around inclusion, this is really what I'm talking about is that that planet, that pale blue dot has this extreme inequality. And when we talk about inclusion, about how do we see this planet? How do we see our fellow human beings as, uh, uh, um, as included in what we do? Whether it is our science, whether it is our developmental aspirations, whether it is trying to overcome uh, um, climate change and, and, and issues that this, this small blue planet faces. And so astronomy gives us this humility of understanding where, uh, 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 where we fit into the bigger picture, how we are the small planet in a big universe. But there's also uh, um, this hope at the same time, because while we see the earth as a planet in this big empty universe, it is also a very special place. It is a place where, so far, the only place on this, in this universe that we have found that has life. So, how do we help make this world a better place? How can we, as the astronomy community, help make this world a better place? And that was the spirit behind the establishment of the Office of Astronomy for Development. It was the idea that we can use these different aspects of astronomy, whether it's the technology, the skills, uh, 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 the link that astronomy has to science and research, uh, the link that astronomy has to culture, you know, the, the fact that, that cultures all around the world have a connection, historical connection to the sun, the moon, the stars. And how do we take all these aspects of astronomy and impact on the on development. And what do we mean by development? Well, these sustainable development goals of the United Nations, this is the closest we have to sort of a common understanding of what development means, because development is different in different parts of the world. What, uh, uh, what development means in the United States might be different from what development means uh, um, um, in, uh, in many countries in Africa, for example. The challenges are different. But this universal definition is what we've adopted as, a, as close as possible to, to some universal understanding of development. But it is not complete, and I must emphasize that. 
However, it's a way of uh, shaping our program. So we look at how astronomy can impact on these SDGs. And so, you know, with our OED projects, we've funded projects around the world. And so we've looked at ways, you know, whether astro tourism can stimulate uh, uh, um, work and economic growth, uh, uh, capacity building using astronomy, like many other speakers have uh, uh, mentioned, promote uh, uh, STEM education. But also using astronomy for diplomacy, you know, bringing together countries to work on common astronomy projects, uh, um, using the the perspective of astronomy to bring people together, and so on. So this office is run by a small team in Cape Town. Uh, uh, um, uh, we have uh, um, uh, um, an astronomer. We have we have a development economist. We have uh, Ram running the, the, the operations. Sorry, this is Vanessa, the astronomer, Tawanda, development economist, Nua handles the office. And we've got uh, three fellows. Uh, um, Nikita looks at big data. Uh, um, um, Amidu looks at astro tourism and, uh, and a flagship on social economic development. And Marie uh, um, uh, looks at specific COVID 19 activities. But you know, again, coming to this, this theme of uh, 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 these running threads, we recognize and acknowledge that there is no way that one office in Cape Town uh, uh, or in any part of the world can understand all that needs to be understood about uh, situations in different parts of the world. And so a fundamental part of our structure is the regional offices of which Rosa and Gustavo run one for the Portuguese um, speaking world. But e these regional offices established around the world is basically about inclusion. It is about uh, uh, recognizing that we cannot solve the world's problems without having people from around the world play a significant part in this. And so uh, uh, each of these regional offices understand the, the nuances of their regions and they bring that to the table. And this diversity is huge. The, um, this picture was taken recently uh, in January. We had the uh, launch of the North American regional office, uh, um, but it was one of our, our, our meetings of all the regional offices. But the, the, the you know how the OED has benefited from the from the diversity of people from all these different parts of the world is huge because uh, you know it helps us to understand it helps us to plan it helps us to say that you know a particular activity that's developed in one part of the world might not work in another part of the world the culture in one part of the world will not work in another part of the world and that doesn't just go in terms of, uh, uh, um, let's say, educational resources and so on, but also culture, meetings. How, you know, how do you handle a meeting? How, uh, what is the culture expectation in terms of responding to emails? In terms of how we do what we do, uh, the differences is huge. Uh, the difference is huge. But bringing all together around a common vision, around a common goal is what brings the strength. Uh, uh, in South Africa, uh, uh, um, our, um, our national em em emblem has the motto, which, which means strength in diversity. And uh, you know, in our country, with our history of uh, uh, forced separation of race groups, uh, um, we know well about the importance of, 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 of recognizing the strength that diverse people bring to the table. So it's not just about people, but also about partners, about skills from different fields. So when we talk about inclusion, looking at making the world a better place, looking at astronomy for development, we recognize the importance of partnerships. So we've got partners from the social sciences, uh, um, partners from, from development economics, of course, astronomy, uh, uh, um, but also the space sciences. And, and it doesn't stop there. We're, we're on a constant search for 
uh, for partners that understand uh, uh, better than us in some ways how astronomy or how our field can make a, a bigger difference globally. And that principle is recognizing that, you know, you have to be humble about it. Astronomy is not going to change the world on its own. Um, astronomy is one part of a bigger, bigger landscape. And if you just take science, for example, uh, and look at science for development, astronomy is one science. There are uh, many other sciences. And each of those sciences have tools. Astronomy has tools, you know, whether it's big data, coding, the outreach community, and so on. Different fields will also have these tools. And by combining our efforts, we can put these tools together and come up with actions or research areas where we can effect change on the sustainable development goals. And this is the principle of science for development or you know, using any of our fields to impact on development. And one of the, the, the things we've done recently uh, as well is partnered with the International Science Council. Uh, this, this was established in, uh, in 2018. And the recognition or the principle behind the establishment of the International Science Council is exactly this, is that uh, uh, the scientific understanding uh, 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 is important for humanity as a whole. And the challenges we have is for humanity as well. So we partnered with the International Science Council and, and uh, had a workshop in January. Um, you can get uh, more at the science for of, but this was about bringing together sciences and looking at how all sciences can impact on development. That is what inclusion is about. It's not just, you know, there, there's not one aspect of inclusion, or other, but it's, 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 it's sort of inclusion as a whole. So uh, getting back to the types of projects and uh, 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 you know, if we want to tackle a particular development challenge, the first question we ask ourselves is who should we be partnering with? Who are the experts in this area? And how can we, how can we partner with them? Now types of projects have, have ranged from uh, uh, um, astrotourism, astronomy for diplomacy. So these are examples of projects uh, uh, and I've put in uh, uh, um, uh, a lot of these examples because I'm planning to share these slides. Um, but, uh, you know, projects using astronomy to reduce inequalities, projects targeting refugee communities, um, projects looking specifically at capacity building uh, or outreach to underrepresented groups. These are all relating to inclusion. Amelia mentioned the, uh, um, her, her, her project with the astronomy kit for the visually impaired, uh, uh, um, but there's been several other projects looking at, at the inclusion for people with disabilities. Um, but, you know, when we talk about inclusion, there's also geographic inclusion, astronomy workshops in different areas, uh, infrastructure, instrument support, um, research or exchange, exchange programs, um, uh, but then we've also had different fields, you know, astronomy and art, uh, media, communication, and of course, teacher training activities. Now, all these projects as a whole uh, um, uh, uh, is funded uh, through our annual call for proposals. And so far, there's been 159 projects out of over a thousand applications. The funding we get is from the International Astronomical Union primarily. Um, and these projects have targeted 90 plus countries. Um, now, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of where these projects are, you'll find an interactive map on our website and, uh, um, and you see these projects all around the world. Here's the big thing about those projects is that in, uh, uh, in terms of, of, of where they, they are implemented, it's completely open, right? The idea is that, you know, anyone anywhere in the world can come up with an idea for a project to use astronomy to impact on development, and then that will be considered. Uh, we've, we've ended up funding a lot of projects in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, uh, Latin America, Central Asia. Um, there tends to be a lot of applications from these regions. Um, and, 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 and it might have to do with the sort of perception of where development is most needed or what development means. 
And this is something that we constantly grapple with. Um, so far, we've had several SDGs that that uh, um, that have been targeted by 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 projects, but by far, so this is a long scale, and by far the biggest is on quality education. So projects looking at how to use astronomy to stimulate quality education. Um, but in uh, implementing these projects, uh, um, uh, um, one of the things we've tried to do over the years is to ensure that we're building on the ideas, experiences of others. Uh, and so we have this project resources database on our website where you can basically search for like any resources uh, uh, created by any of these projects should be accessible to future projects. So any future project should build on uh, the experiences of past projects and be able to look at, for example, if a project was, was, was implemented in South America or Africa, you know, could those ideas be replicated or adapted to Asia or somewhere else? Um, sorry, I keep getting the notifications of uh, I have to look at the chat as well. Because, uh, Don't worry about that, Kevin. If it's necessary, yeah, we'll stop. You just continue. Uh, um, okay, cool. So, uh, um, so the other thing we've tried to do is that is that you know, because we're reaching out to, to anyone anywhere in the world. We, we, we've also tried to use it as sort of a capacity development for developing, for, for, for writing proposals and so on. So we've got an online course as well um, that we use, uh, 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 that we encourage project proposers to go through. Uh, of course, the big question that we've been uh, grappling with from the start is on how do we measure the impact of projects? Uh, so there's all these activities going on. How do we know what the impact is um, so there's an initial, so at the bottom of each of these slides where there's a, 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 a link, uh, all this will, you'll find on our website. So even if you don't take the links down or, or take the slides afterwards, um, you'll find just about everything on our website. And this, uh, on, on the website, you have an interactive uh, sort of infographic looking at, at, the, at, the, at the initial uh, um, um, an initial evaluation of impact of past projects, looking both at implementation and developmental impact. But this is part of a more uh, uh, global effort to look at, uh, um, at at how we measure impact. And so we have this thing called the impact cycle, where the the bottom line of it is we need projects to build on the experiences of others and ultimately get better and better and better until we, we, uh, we can implement projects uh, uh, um, on a large scale. Now, uh, um, this, is, this is where we stand in terms of, of, um, of our projects globally. Now, coming back to these themes, we, we have to recognize that we're not gonna come up with, with great ideas on our own. So we have to learn from these projects. And so over the years, we've sponsored these projects, we've gotten you know, projects, ideas uh, from people on the ground. And we've, we've, we've then analyzed all this and looked at, uh, um, at all these projects and, and, and tried to find, okay, now, if we are going to have hope for global change, hope for making an impact globally beyond these small projects that we sponsor, how do we do that? And how do we, how can we inform ourselves by the projects that we sponsored so far? And this is where flagships come in. So in the 2020, 2030 strategy of the IU, uh, um, under the OED's work, we talk about the development of, a, of global signature projects. And the principle is how do we identify large scale projects that emerge from these funded projects and from our regional offices and look at focused fundraising and sort of rolling out of these projects. So from this exercise, uh, uh, looking at past projects, special projects, partnerships, international trends, um, we came up with five flagships uh, that I mentioned in the abstract for this talk. Uh, um, so first, knowledge and skills from astronomy. So data science skills, teacher training schools, a lot of that, that aspect of astronomy for education. Then technology from astronomy, software technology. Now, when it comes to water, solar power, renewable energies, dark skies, 
these are all aspects linked that have been linked to observatories as you establish an observatory how do you uh, uh, how, how do you build uh, how do you use that technology to 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 build things that can be applied elsewhere um, then stimulating economies how do we you know if if an observatory is established for example how does that benefit the local local communities and astrotourism is a big field in that in that area uh, number four is about addressing inequality and and uh, uh, that's gender, geographic ability, but basically this is the one about inclusion. And then number five is about science diplomacy, you know, uh, uh, peace, post-conflict, uh, 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 we've had projects in refugee camps, projects looking at bringing uh, uh, groups together and so on. And so, uh, um, and so uh, 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 as I mentioned in the abstract, I'll try and bring it to focus a bit around inclusion. Um, uh, and this is this is where where we are going now. Um, to try and round up on this. Um, now, back to this map. If we are to take on challenges of the world, how do we do it inclusively? This is from today, the World Health Organization, um, and this pandemic has turned the world on its head, uh, uh, in a sense. It's been, it's been the biggest event in, in, in our living memory. Uh, uh, um, but what does this mean? And, and, and how should we be responding to this? Um, what does this mean for inclusion, for, for, for equality? Uh, um, now, if you look at these two maps, so this, you know, Africa stands out here as least developed. And in the coronavirus map from World Health Organization, Africa stands out here as least affected. Um, so what's, what's, what's going on here? Now, now before I get into, in, into this, uh, I, I, I thought I'd use the pandemic to sort of, uh, 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 as a good example of where, uh, uh, um, Sort of perspectives have turned around in, in, to a certain extent, or the world has turned around to a certain extent. extent. But before I mention it, I should say that, you know, um, we've been able to respond to the pandemic in various ways. Uh, uh, there's been a call to action for the Sami community in partnership with our sister offices. You would have heard from Lena uh, and from Marcus earlier in, this, in, 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 in the session. Uh, we issued an extraordinary call for COVID-19 related proposals, uh, sponsored 43 projects from, uh, uh, from countries around the world. Uh, we adapted the call for proposals to take into consideration COVID-19. Um, then you'll find a blog series on our website on, on the developmental impacts of COVID-19. And, uh, um, and we have, uh, uh, um, uh, um, and mentioned Marie as one of our team members. She's a fellow that's looking specifically at how astronomy can help in the fight against COVID-19. So just, you know, as an aside, uh, there's things you can do. So do get in touch if, if, if you have ideas as to how uh, astronomy can play a role in this pandemic. Um, but getting back to this, so, so, so these two maps, uh, um, uh, you know, when we talk about development, the level of development, uh, um, what does it do to the resilience of a region, to the resilience of an individual? And I want to, maybe I should mention this. Um, when I started working at the, at, at, at the observatory in Cape Town, I was in charge of a program called the Salt Collateral Benefits Program, and we did a lot of work in the rural parts of South Africa in the Northern Cape province where, um, uh, um, where our telescopes were. Now, um, what, what, um, I was once reprimanded because uh, m uh, the people I reported to uh, felt that I was doing too much sort of late night driving and long distance driving because things are really far away. And so, you know, I'd have a 
a meeting in Sutherland in the evening with the community and then a meeting in Cape Town the next morning and somewhere between I'd, uh, I'd have to do. And so, and so there was this concern that, you know, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm doing too much. I'm putting uh, uh, myself at risk and so on. Now, I grew up in a place where, you know, I grew up in a farming, farming community where like, uh, you know, money was scarce and, and, uh, um, and you worked hard uh, doing an office job that didn't involve like lifting bags of fertilizer or, or, or you know, working in a field and so on, manual labor. Um, that wasn't real work. You know, if you didn't get exhausted by the end of the day, you know, physically exhausted, like, uh, you know, what work are you doing? Now, my culture, the, where I grew up and how I grew up, the value came from, from, from really hard work. And so the standards for what does, you know, uh, um, late night driving or sleep deprivation and things like that was very different from those of the of the people within the astronomy community that I was uh, that I was working with. Now, the reason I'm, I'm saying this or, or painting this picture is that sometimes those who experience hardship or who experience challenges in life are those that are stronger and more resilient and able to do things that we might not think can be done. And, and, and I'm saying this because we need to change our perspective of Africa. We need to change our perspective of development, you know, rather than saying, you know, oh, shame, you know, look at those people. We need to help those people. Rather look at them and say, those are people that are stronger than ourselves. And all that they need is the opportunity. And it's the opportunity that is that, that is what inclusion is about. When we look at the, at the stats uh, uh, and how this is turned on, uh, on their heads, Africa has, has struggled with disease for, for a long time. Coronavirus comes in. Africa is, you, you know, people understand, okay, there's a disease around, we need to, we, we, we need to take care of ourselves. There, there's, a, there's a community that is better prepared than countries in Europe where, you know, they may not, you know, in, in the current generation may not have experienced these things. Now, so when we talk about inclusion and the importance of inclusion globally, we must think about this. We must think about the perspective of uh, 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 seeing the value of people. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna jump, to jump into this inclusion a little bit more. Uh, um, I'm aware of the time. Um, and, uh, uh, and uh, but to start, you know, I, I, I started writing down like all the amazing activities that are going on, including what Amelia just spoke about, the work that she's doing, uh, uh, the work that teams are doing at, uh, at the AAS. There's been movements across the world, Black Lives Matter. Uh, there's been uh, uh, there's been people that came before us. All the struggles for people to be heard, for, for, for people to, to have the right to vote. Uh, these are all things that we are building on the shoulders of when it comes to inclusion. And, uh, um, and, and, and we have to recognize that. And I realize that there's just too many things to name because where we are now in society is because of those who came before us fighting for inclusion, fighting to be included, fighting to have their voices heard that we are where we are. And, and, and of course that fight is not over, you know, globally, we still have lots of inequality that needs to be addressed. But I'm gonna focus on, thing, on something that I know, which is about race. And, and uh, uh, race is one of those aspects of inclusion that, uh, that I think is, is, is really key, but uh, um, uh, um, so, so I'll talk about that, especially from my sort of own experience, like, in growing up in South Africa and so on. Uh, um, so Nelson Mandela said, racism is a blight on the human conscience. Uh, the idea that, that any people can be inferior to another to the point where those who consider themselves superior define and treat the rest as subhuman, denies the humanity, even of those who elevate themselves to the status of gods. 
I think racism is a very good way of using uh, of, 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 of an analogy for, 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 for inclusion or an example of inclusion. Because racism, like so many other isms, sexism and so on, it is a blight on the human conscience. And it is something that it, it, uh, uh, it denies humanity of those who are being racist or sexist or whatever. Because at the end of the day, humanity, what we are is, is everyone. And those who, uh, who, who behave, uh, um, uh, 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 who, who discriminate against others, uh, um, they themselves are denied humanity. But here's the thing, we are all racist, and I'm, I'm focusing on racism, but you can draw your parallels to other isms around. And the reality is that we are all racist, we just, just at different levels. Um, unconscious bias, everyone knows it's a thing, it's a reality, right? And pattern recognition is something that we sort of evolved to do, you know, pattern recognition as human beings uh, 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 recognizing that that uh, you know this kind of mushroom is dangerous because people die. Uh, uh, um, recognizing the patterns of animals for us to hunt, uh, you know, it's it's part of who we are is to is to recognize patterns. But the the key is that we must accept that we are all biased in some way, and the important thing is to recognize our own biases because at the end of the day. I'll talking specifically about racism, but this does apply also. There's nothing more dangerous than a racist person who believes vehemently that they are not. If someone believes that they are not racist, but you know, actually they have these biases, then it leads to poor decisions, it leads to the spreading of racism and other isms as well. Uh, um, and that that is something really, really important is recognizing the biases that we have and because that leads to systemic racism where systems are designed built and sustained by people so racism in people will lead to racism in systems uh, i should have mentioned by the way i borrowed these slides from a, from my own talk that i gave at another at, a, at another event on racism and uh, and and development so here's, here's a big, big thing. Another uh, um, famous South African. Uh, if you are neutral in situation of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. This is a very, very important thing to remember because lots of people say, well, I'm not racist, I'm colorblind, or I'm, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 I don't see the difference. But if you are neutral in a situation of injustice, then you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And the, uh, the example that uh, Archbishop, former Archbishop Gilman Tudor gave you, if an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say you are not neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. And it's very important to bear that in mind. This is, a, the, the, this is the reality we face at the moment. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, this is from one of the West, Web Forum blogs. 90% of capital, so this in terms of investing in development projects, 90% of capital went to startups with one or more European and North American funders. Founders. This is uh, this was the situation in, in East Africa. Now, why is this? Why is it that so much funding in the startup world goes to people that uh, in Africa, but with, with European or North American founders? Uh, in that same blog, foreign investors typically expect sophisticated financial models, detailed business plans, which in their eyes reflect the caliber of the entrepreneur. Now, I'm just reading a part in red, right? Now, so if you don't have a fancy business plan and so on, then it's, it reflects badly. However, the, 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 the unique local knowledge and social capital are valued less highly than quantitative skills in due diligence process. Now I'm giving this as an example because when it comes to funding in development, uh, um, you know, we tend to 
negate or place less value on local knowledge and more on what we perceive to be um, a, a, a good project and so on. And this, uh, this big report, Global Accelerated Learning Initiatives, uh, one of the things that they said was, we wonder whether the perception of lower entrepreneurial skills compared with higher reported rates of experience is connected to cultural bias. What this means is that people were seeing that there's a perception that people are people don't have much skills. This is specifically in Africa. Uh, you know, people don't have uh, have that much skills. But then, when you look at their skills and experience, you find no, but they actually do. So, how is it that there's a perception of low skills when actually there's lots of skill? And this is that cultural bias. Coming. So when we talk about inclusion and things, uh, when we talk about you know having hope for the future, um, we need to be humble and recognize that those people who are at the coal phase, who are able to implement projects, who are able to drive activities, have probably more relevant experience and knowledge than, than those like funders, for example, that might give it. So we need to, to keep this in mind and figure a way of, of being humble about it and not just saying, you know, okay, you must do it this way because we think this is how it works. And this, this goes to general development. So let me round up. Uh, um, I'm coming to, uh, uh, back to this image uh, uh, um, of, of, uh, of, this, uh, of the center of the Milky Way uh, taken by the Mirka telescope. Now, it's not just this image, and I'm going to talk a bit about Africa. In this picture of African continent, astronomy is growing everywhere. This is in Ghana. This is a new radio telescope observatory, uh, but that's not the only one. There are projects across the African continent, and this is a time for Africa. Uh, uh, last year, we had a meeting on astronomy in Africa. We brought together people from across the continent, uh, um, 80 people from over 20 countries, and established the African Astronomical Society um, that tries to rally together this, this community across the continent. And uh, um, in 2018, most of you will know, the IEU agreed to have its General Assembly in 2024, the biggest uh, um, astronomy astronomy meeting uh, uh, in the world in Africa. It will be the first time in the IEU's 100-year history that this, uh, that this meeting will be held in Africa. Now, how can we as a astronomy community use this to turn the world around again, to change the perspective of what inclusion means, of, of what, how we value the, 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 pers the perspectives, the abilities of others? Um, and this was uh, a quote that we've used, never limit yourself because, uh, never limit yourself because of others' limited imaginations, May Jameson. Um, so in, on the African continent, we've rallied together the community to build a vision for an African General Assembly. Uh, and it recognizes, you know, the incredible potential of Africa. Uh, uh, you know, you've heard of the Nobel Peace Prize going to the Prime Minister of, uh, uh, of, of Ethiopia. Everyone's heard of the fastest man on, on the planet coming from Kenya. Um, and the question we've asked is, you know, in terms of people, how, how do we grow the people around uh, uh, this big astronomy event? Infrastructure, uh, uh, the science in Africa, education, development, outreach. Uh, the, the principle is to, to, to use the opportunity of the General Assembly in 2024 to, to, to try to turn around perceptions of Africa. So anyway, this is the website, and this is an invitation to, to, to people to get involved as well. So let me, let me try and close up. Uh, um, um, the one thing that, that I haven't said much about is tolerance. And this is, this is because you know, I have it here because intolerance is one of the greatest challenges we have today. We have people from, 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 from all around the world. We have this growth of 
divisive politics, and the US is the best example of it. Depending which news outlet you read, you'll find stories that are, that are very clearly biased towards one or the other group. And this level of divisiveness comes about for the, from this lack of tolerance. And we in the astronomy field have always spoken about tolerance as something, you know, since Carl Sagan's time, like, you know, the pale blue dot, if we look at the world like this, how can we not see that we need to be tolerant of each other's opinions, uh, uh, that we need to live and work together? And we've engaged in this as well. Uh, uh, at the OED, we have this experiment on how to understand intergroup bias. Uh, uh, um, but at the end of the day, what we have globally is very worrying. It is how people are divisive and divisive on both sides. Do we say we are intolerant of racism? You know, it sounds like that's what we should be saying, right? But saying that means that we are being intolerant of those who hold racist beliefs. It means that we divide the world, we divide our communities, we divide societies. We had a recent uh, uh, experience uh, uh, at our observatory where someone someone said something that was taken taken quite harshly. You know, they were asking a question about about discrimination and about you know the history of discrimination compared to currently where uh, affirmative action is sometimes seen as discrimination against white people um, and that question rather than being embraced and engaged in a conversation was shut down and it was it was quite aggressively uh, said no, we cannot allow this side of this sort of questions. But what have we done? We 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 are we are closing out fellow human beings because of their belief systems. So we need to be careful when we talk about inclusion that we don't go too far, and we 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 still recognize that human beings are human beings. Racism, sexism, all this—it's part of humanity right now. We would, we would love for it not to be. We, we need to change that, but we don't change it by dividing our community, our world. We change it by engaging, we change it by understanding. And how we do that is, is not a trivial matter. And we, we, we've seen this a lot in South Africa. So with that, you know, when we look at the world and and we think about uh, uh, inclusion, when we think about development, when we think about making the world a better place, um, I hope that this sort of thread of thought about hope, humility, and tolerance, things that are important for us to make the world a better place. And at the end of the day, when, when change is in it, inevitable, when, when, when challenges are inevitable, when, when a gloomy future uh, in terms of climate, in terms of people, seems to be coming towards us. Our hope has to reside in people, in all people. And we must look at inclusion both in both directions. Inclusion towards uh, uh, respecting people's perspectives, regardless of how extreme some of these perspectives is, because the only way we're going to be able to make the world a better place is to bring everybody together. So with that, let me conclude with my contact details and uh, well, my contact details will be available. And let me stop there. Took, my apologies, I took a bit longer than I thought. That was absolutely perfect, Kevin, as, uh, as usual. I think that uh, you, you bring uh, inclusion to a, a whole new level. You bring inclusion inside ourselves where we have to, to recognize our bias as you said, we grew up in, embedded in a, in, a, in, in, a, in a world that has so many problems that uh, we have not named, we have not touched. And uh, you, you gave a few examples where people think, oh, I could have been there, I could have done that. So yeah, I think it's, there's a lot uh, to, to be learned.
but uh, I think I see no other way of uh, changing things rather than with examples like yourself or the work that is being done by the regions or all the partners and friends that we have from the astronomy for development world. So it's by examples that uh, that we change the world. So thank you for your work and for leading such an amazing effort and for the work of all the all the team doing different things, inclusive things um, to try and make this, this world a better place, which is difficult, but doable. Uh, we don't have a specific question. I think you just, you know, you blew, you blew out the minds of everyone. I just see people saying, thank you. It was inspiring. And I think that you, you have touched deeply uh, everyone. People have to really take in uh, the things you said. I'm very glad that your talk is going to be, was recorded and it's going to be online so people can refer to and rethink uh, many things. But before I pass over to my colleague who is chairing the next session, I'm going to ask you something very dangerous, very, very, very dangerous. If you were granted a wish for the future, what would you wish for not personally as Kevin Govender, human being who has a family, and I, I, I'm sure I know what your wishes would be, but as the, the director of the Office, the Office of Astronomy for Development and looking to the future and where you can go, what you can reach with this um, power, because you know, with power comes responsibility and you have been using it very well without, with humility and tolerance and everything that uh, is encompassed in it. So. What would be your wish? And be careful what you wish for. <laughs> um, look, I, 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 you know, there's different levels to that question. You know, maybe you know, there's 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 what I wish for for the OED, what I wish for for uh, um, for you or for or for this community. Uh, but I think. Uh, uh, I think if I could summarize it as a single thing for the world, I just wish that people would would listen to each other, and you know that people would would respect each other. That we can, you know, there's just so much, and there's so much anger and so much so much uh, hatred and, uh, and things going around, and. It just feels like you know we don't we don't listen we don't we don't put ourselves into another person's shoes because at the end of the day a very important thing to realize is that everything that is done almost everything that is done is done with good intention when 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 settlers when missionaries traveled to african countries and and, and sometimes decimated local cultures, it was done with good intention. When people start wars, it is done with good intention. And sometimes we do, you know, almost everything we do in the world is with good intention. And if we recognize that we are human beings and we listen to each other and we try and find the common ground, that would be my hope. We just let people come together. So we end this uh, talk with uh, perhaps summing up less egos, more hope, more humility, more tolerance. Thank you very much, Kevin. You are unique. Round of applause for you and for inspiring us to the next level. Thank you so much. <laughs>